السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear viewers everywhere welcome to another edition of your program Gardens of the Pious Today's edition is an episode number 307 and it will be the second in explaining and studying chapter number 77. It's a beautiful chapter that deals with feeling angry whenever the divine law is violated. And al intisaru li deenillah, supporting the deen of Allah the Almighty. Um, the following hadith is hadith number 650 in the series of Gardens of the Pious. In this hadith, which is agreed upon its authenticity, Aisha radiyallahu anha narrated, Anna Qurayshan ahammahum sha'nu al-mar'ati al-makhzumiyyati al-lati sarakat, faqalu man yukallimu fiha rasoolallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, faqalu man yajtari'u alayhi illa usamatu ibn Zayd, حب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فكلمه أسامة فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أتشفع في حد من حدود الله تعالى ثم قام فاختطب ثم قال إنما أهلك من قبلكم أنهم كانوا إذا سرق فيهم الشريف تركوه وإذا سرق فيهم الضعيف أقاموا عليه الحد وأيم الله لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد سرقت لقطعت يدها متفق عليه This is a very fascinating hadith brothers and sisters It establishes the concept of equality before law and Islam is law and order. And no one is above the law. No matter who is this person. What you normally hear from some people, didn't you know who am I, does not exist in Islam. I mean, it should not exist. Obviously, nowadays, we hear a lot of people present themselves as big shots. In a sense, they are above the law. So they break the law. Even amongst those who make the law, they break it because they are above people. This is totally forbidden in Islam. The most honorable and the greatest person in, in general, and the greatest human being ever, the best man ever walked the earth is Muhammad, peace be upon him. And for Muslims, their most beloved and their great role model is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should learn from him how he set the example in this regard. And the hadith is also mentioned in this chapter, chapter number 77, to show us that sometimes this most merciful man, the kindest person ever walked the earth, the softest heart person, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes used to get angry. He won't get angry because somebody hurt his feeling or even insulted him or happened to hurt him by any means. No. Only whenever any of the laws or the commandments of Allah the Almighty are being violated, he would only get angry in this case. So his anger was reason because of violating the ordinances of Allah the Almighty. 
Other than that, he never took revenge for himself. He cried when his uncle Al Hamza, Asadullah wa Asadu Rasule, was killed and mutilated. And he was killed in a brutal way. He was not killed fighting in a combat one to one, face to face. No. Wahshi was hired by somebody from Mecca and he was hiding, waiting in an ambush until he had a clear view of uh, Al Hamza's back. So he threw his spear into him. He penetrated his body and he came out of his stomach. Then he died and then his body was mutilated. The Prophet ﷺ felt so sad and he cried when he saw his uncle in this condition. It was not an honor way, an honorable way to kill any person. Yet, this person who have killed Al Hamza, now the Prophet ﷺ sees him, he meets him, he did not take revenge because Wahshayev accepted Islam and he become Muslim. No personal revenge. Only whenever any of the hudud of Allah are being violated, like in this example. A woman who is known as Mar'atun Makhzumiyya belonged to the very famous and noble tribe Bani Makhzum. The Arab, even before Islam, they revered names and fames and some families and some tribes were very honorable and some others were known of being inferior or known of being thieves like Bani Makhzum was a very honorable family and among them the leaders and the chieftains Bani Tayyip uh, were known of having plenty of thieves so a woman from Bani Makhzum that means it means a lot. She is a very prestigious woman. What did she do? This woman have committed theft. The hadith says that Quraysh were much worried about the case of the Mahzumiyya woman who had committed theft and wondered who should intercede for her before the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. They thought about it and they said, well, the best person to do so is Hibbu Rasulillah, the most beloved to the Messenger of Allah, the one who's so dear to his heart. Only him can dare to do so. Who was he? Usama ibn Zayd ibn Haritha. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. So Usama accepted the challenge and he went to the Prophet وسلم, and spoke to him about this matter. Upon that, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Do you intercede when one of the legal boundaries ordained by Allah has been violated, O Usama? Then he got up and he addressed the people, saying, The people before you were ruined because whenever a noble person among them committed theft, they would leave him. They would let him go. But if a weak person amongst them committed theft, they would execute the legal punishment on him. By Allah, were Fatima the daughter of Muhammad to commit the theft, I would have cut off her hand. The hadith is collected by Imam al-Bukhari wa Muslim. This woman used to borrow things from people and then she would deny it. And this is theft. Once, twice, then she was caught and the case was presented before the Prophet ﷺ. There is a very important information that I want to share with you, which is, if there is a sin which is punishable by Allah in the life of this world, is now presented before the judge or the court in Islam, no one has the right to intercede. Not even the person whose rights were violated. If he wants to pardon, not anymore, it's over. If somebody was caught committing theft and now he is taken and he's been presented before the judge, he's a thief, there are witnesses, and the person uh, who is the plaintiff for innocence is having 
the case before the judge. If he wants to withdraw the case and says, because now the punishment is very severe. Uh, he said that he committed theft, he stole 100 grams or something worth that much. And now he said, okay, we settle the case and he will pay me back and I, I want to drop the case. Well, this right, which was violated, was not only your right, the right of the person who was uh, stolen from, and there is the right of Allah the Almighty. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah the Almighty said, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَقُطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَسَبَا نَكَالًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ so there is a severe punishment for committing theft. This punishment is stated by Allah the Almighty. And that's why by the end is and Allah is Almighty, all wise. This is a punishment which Allah the Almighty have chosen. And it is mighty punishment and it is out of wisdom. Imagine if every manager, let's not talk about the thieves now. Imagine if every manager, advisor, minister, prime minister, or any person who is in a position of leadership have committed theft or have taken something from the property which, is he, which he is entrusted to look after, then he's caught and he is presented before the court and his hand is cut off. Every person would think a million times before even daring to think about taking anything which is not his. We're not talking about stealing to eat because somebody is starving. That's a different case. We're talking about those who rib of the Muslim society, rib of the country, whether it's a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society. The punishment is severe. Why? Because in order and in proportion with the crime, in order to seize this crime. So when people would think about equality in punishment, uh, if I were to kill this person who is aggravating me, who is making me very angry, if I were to kill him, I will get killed. If I'm caught, no, I'm not going to get killed. I don't want to get killed. Then don't kill others. You want your hands to be safe? Do not approach any property or any wealth which is not used. Do not commit theft. Okay? Allahu Azizun Hakim. So she committed theft. Then the case were taken, was taken to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. He said, Okay, apply the punishment because the case is uh, confirmed. Now everybody was worried because she belonged to a very noble family. And it will be an unprecedented event. A woman from Bani Makhzum, and she will be punished for committing theft. What a shame. Ah, who can talk to the Prophet? Who dares to talk to the Prophet? They said, oh, he loves Usama so much. He loved Usama and he loved his father. His father is Zayd ibn Haritha, who was a slave. Khadija radiallahu anha owned Zayd ibn Haritha as a slave. And then she gave him as a gift to the Messenger of Allah. All of that was before uh, he was appointed to be a messenger. The Prophet ﷺ was the kindest even before the prophethood. So Zayd loved to be in the service of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. His family knew that Zayd is a slave and under the guardianship of this kind man. His father and his uncle went to him and he said, we'll pay you anything, just send our son with us. He said, what about if I offer you something better than that? You don't have to pay anything. You can just go and collect your son and he's free if he wishes to join you. So they celebrated that. Son, you're free, you can come with us. He said, but I want to stay with Muhammad. So he preferred being a slave with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then being free and going home with his family. There must be a reason. There must be reasons. He have lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He have seen how he treated him, not like a slave, not as a servant, rather like a brother, like a son. So when he chose to remain as a slave under 
the guardianship of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam over going home and to be free with his family, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi rewarded him. So he announced in front of the Kaaba, from now on, Zaid is gonna be my son, and he changed his name to Zaid, the son of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Which later on the case was abrogated and Allah said everyone should bear the name of his own father or her father, not the name of anyone else. After that was stated in Surah Al-Ahzab, he returned back to be called Zaid ibn Haritha. Of course it saddened him because what an honor, what an honor to be called the son of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He was honored to be called Zayd ibn Muhammad even before the prophethood. Now while Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is mercy to mankind, is mercy to everything that exists, and he's the last messenger, the honor is with no limits. Zayd ibn Muhammad, Zayd, the son of the messenger of Allah. So of course it saddened his heart. So Allah the Almighty, compensated him for that and made it up for him by mentioning his name in Surah Al-Ahzab. He was the only companion whose name is mentioned in the Quran. Abu Bakr was referred to in the Quran several times. Several times. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab was referred to in the Quran several times. But no one's name was mentioned explicitly in the Quran like that other than Zayd. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَكَ Only Zayd's name was mentioned in the Quran. Then he gave him Ummu Ayman, Barakah, was like a foster mother and a, a, a nanny to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He gave him uh, Ummu Ayman to marry. And when they got married, she got pregnant and she delivered Usama. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved Usama as much as he loved his father. And now Usama believes that. I'm very near to the Prophet Sallallahu and he doesn't think that he've done anything wrong. He's interceding. And this is something that is recommended in Islam, to intercede. But when, how, why? Not in something which Allah the Almighty have prescribed, there is a punishment. So if somebody committed the theft, should be punished with adequate punishment, okay? No matter who is this person. Once Usama accepted to speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to the Mahzumi woman to intercede for her, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got very angry. Now why? Because, you know, you guys are not supposed to do that. This is a had, a punishment that is stated by Allah the Almighty. أَتَشْفَعُ فِي حَدٍ مِّنْ حُدُودِ اللَّهِ يَا أُسَامَ He was offended. It is true that he loved Usama so much that he was called Hibbu Rasulillah and the son of Hibbu Rasulillah, beloved to the Messenger of Allah. But how dare you do that? Do you intercede when one of the legal boundaries ordained by Allah has been violated, O Usama? Then he thought it is very important to educate the entire Muslim community. So he gathered them. Ikhtataba, yani he delivered a speech. Then he said, you know what destroyed the nations before you? What destroyed them is what you're trying to do now. Whenever a person who belongs to a noble family have committed theft, they would pardon him. They would excuse him. They would find a reason in a way or another to release him or her. But if the person who committed theft is a weak person, doesn't have a big family, then they would throw the book at him and execute the legal punishment immediately. They would be very firm. This practice is what ruined nations before us, and this is what is ruining our nation as of today, brothers and sisters. What we like in the West, in the non-Muslim societies, in most cases, we've got to be honest that everyone is equal before the law. This is what we see. We have heard 
that George W. Bush got a ticket for drinking and driving and he was jailed and his father was the CIA director he was not like any officer and nowadays even if you're not an officer if you know an officer you can speak to somebody to speak to another person because my son is caught with drugs if there is any way that we can take him out and I promise this will be the last time okay but it will cost you that much okay work on it and release him once I was uh, somewhere and this person asked me to make dua for his son he said because he's in jail um, he is a high ranking officer but he is uh, he's been jailed for something that he committed and they asked me if you pay that much it was like a million we will release him for you so I'm collecting the fund for that pray for me I didn't know what to do pray for what there is no justice a high ranking officer or if you know somebody or if you belong to this person if you're a company owner or if you can pay under the table then there is no law and order it's a chaos Allah the Almighty establishes a state which establishes justice even if there are non-Muslims. And if a Muslim state does not establish justice, it will be ruined. This is what he said in this hadith which is agreed upon its authenticity. And this is what is happening. And this is what we see. Sometimes at school you find a, a student at college university whose father is the head of the department his father is a professor but the student maybe failed one class they didn't score very good but because of his father's position they will upgrade him to the point that he will be the first or second or third even though he's not qualified cheating injustice this is what is ruining our education system this is what is ruining our military system and police system and every system. Why? Because of recommendations, because of connections, because of interceding without right. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what ruined the nations before you is whenever a person who belonged to a big family uh, or a noble family have committed theft, they would excuse him, leave him. Whenever a poor person would commit theft, then they will execute the legal punishment with no mercy. Then the Prophet ﷺ remarked saying, لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد He mentioned Fatima. Why? Fatima was the dearest to the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. No doubt. His daughter, Fatima bint Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with her, the mother of Al-Hasan al Hussein, the youth and the leaders of the youth in paradise. May Allah be pleased with all of them. He said, God forbid, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, not the daughter of anyone, were to commit theft, Muhammad would cut off her hand, would apply the punishment upon her. No exceptions, no excuses. You violated the system, you violated the law. No one should be outlaw, even if it is my daughter. By the way, the woman who committed theft, Al-Mar'atul Mahzumiyya, her name was Fatima too, Fatima al Mahzumiyya. He said, not only Fatima, the one who was from Mahzum or Bani Mahzum committed theft, no. Even if she was Fatima bint Muhammad, I would have applied the punishment upon her. Now I guess we know what we're missing. We're missing justice. And why was the Prophet وسلم, offended? It's a single case. And it's a simple case. And you could have uh, uh, preached Osama ibn Zayd in private. But he feared that this is a very, <coughs> very serious matter. And it can deteriorate the condition of the Muslim Ummah and it can ruin them. And that's why he thought it is important to correct that in public. And that's why Aisha said, فَاخْتَطَبَ He gathered the Muslim community and he delivered uh, a speech to warn them again is that well brothers and sisters before tackling the following hadith hadith number uh, 651 would like to go for a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple of minutes please stay tuned <laughs> 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in seven different ways of recipe. Similarly, Maryam alayhi salam, she's a woman by herself. She doesn't even have a husband who's ever touched her. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted a child to Maryam alayhi salam. Look at that. She said that, how will I have a child? How will I have a child whilst I've never even been touched by a man? One of the unique things about this story is that it's not like Umar al-Khattab hasn't heard these verses. Can you imagine that Umar al-Khattab hasn't heard these verses? He became sick from the effect that this ayah ended up having on his, on his mind. Scholars are the transmitters of the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They carried his message and his legacy generation after another. And they are the one who carried this light to the whole world. The Life of the Muslim Scholars is a new series on Huda TV. Through studying their life and exploring many aspects of their lives, we will come to learn so many lessons get motivated and inspired by their stories, by their dedication for Islam and for the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through this series, I hope that it, we will be able, inshallah ta'ala, to get motivated not to achieve only success in the akhirah, but in dunya as well. Join me, Walid Basuni, in this new series on Huda TV about the life of the Muslim scholars. Looking forward to having you. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. And in this segment, inshallah, we'll begin with a new hadith, hadith number 651. The hadith is once again agreed upon its authenticity and it is narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an. An Anas radiyallahu anhu anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallama ra'a nukhamatan fil qiblah فشق ذلك عليه حتى رؤي في وجهه فقام فحكه بيده فقال إن أحدكم إذا قام في صلاته فإنه يناجي ربه وإن ربه بينه وبين القبلة فلا يبزقن أحدكم قبل القبلة ولكن عن يساره أو تحت قدمه ثم أخذ طرف ردائه فبصق فيه ثم رد بعضه على بعض فقال أو يفعل هكذا متفق عليه أنس ابن مالك may Allah be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him once not spitting in the masjid in the direction of the qibla so the signs of disgust were perceived on his face. Then he stood up and he scrapped it away with his own hand and said, when you stand in prayer, you hold communion with your Lord. You are communicating 
with your creator and he is between you and the qibla let no one therefore cast out his spirit in that direction but only to his left or under his foot then he can hold a corner of his sheet and he spat into it and he folded it up and said or he should do like this the word nukhama means mucus or sputum somebody happened to spit in the masjid how dare you spit in the masjid well the masajid back then uh, were not uh, furnished with carpet or rugs it was simply uh, sand all sand and pebbles and the Prophet sallallahu said the ransom if somebody spits in the masjid, in the masjid is to bury it some people especially bad ones do not see any difference between outside the masjid and inside the masjid it's all sand and maybe you remember the story of the Badun who just not only spat in the masjid he passed urine in the masjid okay so he saw in the direction of the Qibla the mucus somebody spat there that's why the hadith is mentioned in this chapter to get angry whenever any of the hudud of Allah the ordinances of Allah have been violated then he got up and he stood up and he faced the community and he started teaching them that whenever you are praying you are holding a communication with Allah you are talking to Allah and as you remember that we studied the hadith the sound hadith in which Allah the Almighty says قسمت الصلاة بيني وبين عبدي نصفين that Allah the Almighty says I have divided the prayer particularly the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha in the prayer between me and my servant so whenever you recite the Fatiha which is a Muslim every single rak'ah you are you're holding a dialogue with Allah the Almighty you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allah the Almighty says Hamadani Abdi my servant praise me you say uh, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Allah the Almighty says Athna alayya abdi Maliki yawmiddin Majjadani abdi and so on there is a dialogue back and forth you recite one ayah Allah replies back to you then according he says go ahead and ask whatever you ask for I shall fulfill it for you this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said yunaji rabbah whenever you're praying you're talking to your Lord there is a communication between you and your creator how dare while you're praying and communicating with Allah you spit in the direction of the Qibla sometimes a person is having the urge of spitting having cold flu and there is mucus and there is uh, sputum or cough with uh, sputum so in this case the person have to spit okay what to do the etiquette of spitting in the hadith the Prophet ﷺ said فَلَا يَبْزُقَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ قِبَلَ الْقِبْلَةِ if you are praying or if you are in the masjid you should not uh, spit in the direction of the qibla rather to the right or to the left or beneath your feet that if you are outside the masjid inside the masjid the Prophet ﷺ showed us by holding the corner or the edge of his rida of his garment and he spat in it and he demonstrated what you should do nowadays we have nicotines we have tissues we have napkins take the napkin out and spit in it then put it in your pocket I know subhanallah some people because they are under the impression that if you make three moves in the prayer your prayer will be invalid according to Hanafi Madhab if you make unnecessary moves but three movements will not invalidate the prayer anyway but even if you hold this view and you follow it but this is a necessary move it's like when somebody's phone goes off and it starts ringing and the person doesn't bother maybe he has an adhan or a citation of Quran or a long song on his ringtone we're praying the Imam is reciting, I'm leading the prayer, and somebody's phone, the ring is, oh, and it keeps going on and on. 
And sometimes a person who calls once, no answer, he calls again and again. So out the prayer. And the person doesn't bother to touch his phone. Why? Because he's afraid if he were to put his hand in his pocket and touch the phone, one, two, three, then my prayer is invalid. Ya akhi, my dear brother, you messed up all our prayers because of lack of your knowledge, lack of etiquette, lack of understanding. When you walk into the masjid, turn your phone off, put it on silent, in case that you forgot and that happens. In this case, and your phone starts ringing, take it out and mute it. Turn it off so that you will not ring back. Some people do silent the voice, but the other guy on the other line is very, maybe it's an emergency. So he keeps calling, calling, calling throughout the prayer. We need to learn the etiquette of going to the masjid. If I'm leading the prayer on somebody, or if I'm praying as an imam, and somebody's phone is doing like that, it's very offensive. It distracts our attention. Now I'm not being offended because of something personal, but because this is a place of worship. Quiet. Everybody should be quiet. Want to enjoy the prayer. Want to have khushu' and the salah. You're distracting not only my attention, the attention of everyone. You're messing up our khushu' and the prayer. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ's face changed. He was angry when he saw this misbehavior, people is spitting in the masjid. And he picked it up and he rubbed it off by his own hand. He cleaned it up by his own hand, sallallahu in another narration with a stick in his hand. Why? To teach us that even if you see somebody else did so, do not hesitate to remove it and correct it and say, it's none of my business because this is a masjid. We should take the initiative to clean up the masjid. We all take it for granted. We walk into the masjid and we never think, who has been cleaning up the masjid? You know, it's a very difficult operation. It's not an easy task. Al-Masjid al-Haram. Thousands and thousands of workers. Some of these workers are working there only to be in al-Haram. Some of them are rich. They're only working to serve Allah in the Haram. You find some people, they eat the dates and they leave the seed. They throw the seeds in it. Why? There are servants. They will take care of that. Those servants are better than you. Better than me. Okay? And if you see, while you're performing tawaf, you step on those seeds. They hurt your feet. Pick them up if you can. And if you see them anywhere in the masjid, collect them. The, 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 the plastic cups, the disposable cups. People drink and eat and leave them. And you find somebody clipping his nails in the masjid, whether in the haram or any other masjid. And until today, even though outside the haram, the sanctuary, outside the masjid, the courtyard, whether in Mecca or Medina, people pray outside, right? And in the streets, you see people, uh, you know, blowing their nose, spitting, mucus, sputum, and they spit in the streets. It doesn't dry up immediately because this is concrete this is marble and guess what somebody somehow is going to pray there once the iqama is called pray people pray everywhere and you find somebody is spitting there lack of etiquette they don't understand oh the prophet sallallahu said only do not spit towards the qibla you can spit you can turn around and spit well when you turn around and spit somebody will be facing the qibla and will make sujood on your spit on your mucus okay so in the masjid nowadays we all have tissues napkins and nakash pick it up if you don't the corner of your shirt or whatever do not spit in the masjid at all under any circumstances whether to the right or to the left or any direction it's a it's a place now it's not furnished with sand and pebbles in the past if you didn't have any place you can bury it. And that's a kafara. But now, you don't do that. You only spit if you want to, or you blow your nose in your tissues, in your napkins, or in your own clothes if you don't have anything. It happens sometimes if the person is having a runny nose. Do not let it run on the carpet. You can do that. I know that it is disgusting, but it is better than let it fall on the carpet or on the rug. Besides, it is disgusting and it is dirty, 
it is contagious. Somebody else is going to pray there and put his forehead and nose there. So the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated by taking the corner of his clothes, of his rida, and he spat into it and he folded it up and he said, or he should do like that. Uh, brothers and sisters, that was the last hadith in this chapter, chapter number 77. And we will begin immediately with a new chapter, beautiful chapter, which I wish that all of us will benefit out of that. I know that the presidents, the rulers, the kings, the sultans, the princes don't have time to watch us, but you never know. Maybe somebody can benefit out of this somehow. Because leadership is not only meant to address the rulers. We will learn from the hadith that everyone somehow is a leader. You are maybe a leader on your little family, your wife and kids. Maybe you are a leader in your factory. Maybe you are a headmaster, a president of a university, a dean of a school. So there are various types of leadership and this chapter will be dealing. Babu. أمري ولاة الأمور بالرفق برعاياهم. Chapter number 78, the obligation of rulers to show kindness to their subjects, to show kindness to those who are under their leadership and under their guardianship. The first reference is of ayah number 215 of Surah Al-Shu'ara, a beautiful choice. A great ayah. In this ayah, Allah the Almighty says, "Waqfid jana hakali man ittabaka min al-mu'minin." Allah is commanding His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Only His Messenger, of course not. All the Muslim leaders and those who will succeed the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in leading the Ummah. And every imam and every leader in any position, chapter number 26, Surah Ash-Shu'ara, اخفض جناحك. Al-janah means a wing. Lower your wing and humble yourselves before, humble yourself before the believers who followed you. اخفض جناحك is a metaphor. It has been used before when we studied how a person should deal with his parents. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ اخْفِضْ لَهُمَا الجناح means a wing. اخْفِضْ جَنَاحَك Which creation have wings? Birds. And why do they have wings? How do you utilize them? They utilize them to beat their wings in order to fly up high. Right? Hmm? Uh, so the wings and beating the wings is a sign of elevation and getting higher and higher you are already in the position of leadership lower your wing yani come down land come down to a lower level do a complete landing in order to deal with humility and humbleness with your followers. Do not deal with them from above, from a superior level. Come to a complete landing. And the Prophet ﷺ was exactly like that. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ By the means of a mercy that Allah bestowed upon you, لِنْتَ لَهُمْ You become lenient with them. You become kind and gentle to them. Have you been harsh-hearted? They would have dispersed away from you. But the fact of the matter that the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa loved them more than they loved their own selves, their family members, their own children, spouses. Why? Because he is our most beloved. Why? Because of his mercy, because of his kindness. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ So you want to be loved, you want to be respected out of love, not out of fear. You want to be appreciated, lower your wing. Humble yourself to the believers. 
those who follow you. The next command is in Surah An-Nahl, the very famous ayah. In the Sagad, ayah number 90 of Surah An-Nahl, An-Nahl is the honeybee, chapter number 16. We hear this ayah say this very famous because we hear it awfully in the Friday sermon. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal bagh ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon Indeed, Allah enjoins justice and performing duties in an excellent manner and giving help to the relatives and forbids evil deeds and all that is prohibited and oppression he admonishes you that you may take heed the first command is al-adl what does allah command three things adl ihsan ita'id al-qurba adl justice ihsan good doing ita'id al-qurba giving the relatives giving them help charity supporting them financially and he forbids on the opposite three things fahsha he forbids what all evil deeds major sins and munkar minor sins well baghi oppression and injustice by the end he reminds you in order to take heed he admonishes you to take heed the person must be adil must be just to himself to his family members, to everyone, including his enemies. You find Allah the Almighty says, وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا سورة المائدة اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى Let not the enmity between you and others and your enemies divert you from justice not because you're dealing with enemies you deal with them unjustly no even if you have a case between you and enemies you should be just in dealing with them i'dilu be just this is nearer to piety and righteousness okay so kunu qawamina lillahi shuhada'a bil qasd even if the case which is presented before the judge is between you and a kafir not because he's a kafir that the judge would uh, deal with him unjustly or favor you over him because he, you are a Muslim or because you are his relative or because you are his dad or his son. No. So you must be just no matter whom you're dealing with. Justice to yourself. Do justice to yourself, to your wife, to your children, to the rest of the world. Insha'Allah, in the next episode, we'll begin with the segment to talk about how a person could uh, do wrong to himself and how he should be just to himself and obviously others and provide examples to that. But until then, brothers and sisters, I leave you all in the care of Allah the Almighty. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفُرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price.